This year, the average American will spend nearly $600 on gift cards, more than all other gifts combined. Naturally, a few of those $198 billion will go unused. Cards get lost in the couch, forgotten entirely, or a few pennies here and there left as remainder. Individually, these financial leftovers are insignificant. But collectively, they add up. Starbucks, now as much a bank as a coffee shop, held $181 million worth of stored credit in 2021. And when Radio Shack declared bankruptcy, it reported $46 million worth of unredeemed gift cards. Where does all that money go? Common sense would say the company's pockets, of course. Why else would gift cards be placed in prominent high-traffic parts of the store? But not necessarily. Quite often, unused gift cards are commandeered by the state. And not just any state. Not, as you might reasonably assume, the state where the card was purchased. Nor even the home state of its buyer. In reality, a significant portion of all unclaimed gift cards across the entire United States, regardless of where they were purchased, are seized by just one state. The second smallest state, in fact. Delaware. And its tiny population of one million profits enormously. Delaware is one of five states with no sales tax, along with Alaska, Oregon, Montana, and New Hampshire. It also has one of the lowest property taxes in the country. Yet, despite collecting lower overall taxes than any state except resource-rich Alaska, Delaware spends more per capita than all but three others. In other words, Delaware operates in many ways like a tiny, profit-seeking, rent-maximizing, oil-rich emirate. Rather than being blessed with a natural resource like oil, it's been granted the near-exclusive legal right to collect many of America's unused gift cards. Sponsored by Nebula, the exclusive home to my original series, China Actually. Delaware is not the only place that seizes unclaimed property. All 50 states have laws of this variety. When someone dies without heirs, for instance, the state takes custody of their home. If no rightful owner is found, it's sold and the proceeds redistributed to the public. But this process, called a sheetment, was envisioned with physical property in mind. As wealth became increasingly intangible, things got complicated. In 1965, four different states tried to claim the same undeposited paychecks from Sun Oil worth $26,000. Texas, where the checks were issued, conveniently argued the state which had the most significant contacts with the debt should receive them. New Jersey, where the company was legally incorporated, argued it was entitled to the profits. Because Sun Oil was headquartered in Pennsylvania, it too made a play for the money, as the debtor's principal place of business. Finally, Florida's claim was based on the last known address of the paycheck recipients. The Supreme Court was charged with deciding which of these rules to sanctify with its gavel and pretend wasn't as arbitrary as the next. In the end, the court did what courts are good at, concealing the arbitrary nature of its ruling with complexity. The fairest solution, it said, would be a compromise. First, unclaimed property would be assigned based, as Florida suggested, on the recipient's last known address. In the unlikely event none could be found, it would simply revert to where the company was incorporated, in this case, New Jersey. But what the court failed to anticipate was the monumental rise of gift cards. Almost by definition, no one knows the last known address of the owner of a gift card. After all, most gift cards are gifted to someone else. In practice, therefore, unused gift cards almost always belong to the state in which the company is registered. And that state is almost always Delaware. This is the number of Fortune 500 companies registered in each state as of 2018. Virginia has 11, Ohio 16, and New York 20. 
Now watch what happens when we add Delaware at well over 300. Delaware is to corporations what Liberia, Panama, and the Marshall Islands are to ships. The only difference is that Liberia, Panama, and the Marshall Islands have competition. Whereas, 95% of businesses that incorporate outside their home state choose Delaware. The first and most obvious reason is money. Delaware doesn't tax intangible investments like trademarks and patents, allowing companies to transfer their mascots, logos, and jingles to the state and save millions. The second is speed. An interaction with the Delaware Division of Corporations would blow the mind of anyone with the misfortune of having visited a DMV. If you're willing to pay extra, you can form your company in less than 30 minutes. And its offices stay open until midnight, making life easy for anyone in Dubai, Lagos, or Hong Kong. Then there's the extreme anonymity. You don't need to prove your identity to register a business in Delaware. In fact, you don't have to provide your name, address, or phone number. All the state requires is a single contact person who can be anyone 18 or older who lives on planet Earth, whether or not they're a US citizen or even live in the country. In theory, any state in the union could offer companies anonymity, speed, and low taxes. But there's one thing only Delaware has, decades and decades of legal precedent. The United States inherited from England two types of courts, common law and chancery, the latter of which dealt with issues of fairness, especially in the realm of property. Since then, most states have merged the two into one superior court, except three, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Delaware. Today, the Delaware Chancery Court is effectively a separate justice system for corporations. Instead of erratic juries, its decisions are made by specialized judges who've seen thousands of similar cases. In other words, corporations choose Delaware for its predictability. Now, it may sound like the state of Delaware is effectively colluding with corporate America, but not exactly. Sure, Delaware fights hard to attract companies, but at the same time, it's hardly any less profit-oriented than they are. Once they've set up shop, it extracts from them every last penny it can. Needless to say, this near-monopoly on corporate registration is extraordinarily profitable. It collects more in corporate fees alone than 42 states collect in corporate income taxes. But the state of Delaware is far from satisfied. It wants more. And that puts it on a collision course with nearly everyone else. Take gift cards, for instance. Delaware interprets the 1965 Supreme Court ruling as a license to collect virtually all of America's unused gift cards, and it will aggressively fight any company or even government that stands in its way. Remember, the purpose of a sheetment is, first and foremost, to reunite lost property with its owner. The state is a mere custodian until a rightful heir is found. Because it's nearly impossible to track down the rightful heir of a gift card, many states have quite sensibly exempted them. But it doesn't matter. Delaware still claims that money as its own, even when the company in question has not a single office, employee, or customer within its borders. In other words, the states of California, Texas, and New York, for example, can't decide what happens to the unused gift cards sold in their own territory. It's as if Delaware could impose an extraterritorial income tax on residents of Nevada, where there isn't one. Its motive, of course, is revenue. Lots of it. In 2001, the state discovered that less than 1% of companies had reported unclaimed property and decided to crack down. It outsourced the enforcement of this arcane law to four auditing firms. These auditors, in turn, would reach out to companies with a wildly high estimate of what they owed. If the company couldn't disprove this enormous number with 20 years worth of documentation, it would be forced to cough up the money. While the state of Washington keeps its unclaimed property forever and even has a staff of people searching for its rightful owner, only about 2% is ever returned in Delaware. 
The rest, it simply spends. Unclaimed property is Delaware's third largest source of revenue, behind only personal income taxes and corporate fees. In 2016, a federal judge ruled that the state of Delaware was, quote, engaged in a game of gotcha that shocks the conscience. The victims in this game are not only corporations, but the entire United States. By delegating to states the power to register corporations with no minimum standards, the U.S. federal government unleashed a race to the bottom. A race that would ultimately benefit one state to the detriment of all others. Then, in 1965, the Supreme Court further tipped the scales in Delaware's favor by unintentionally granting it a virtual monopoly on unclaimed corporate property. Recall that its rationale at the time was fairness to every state. The court didn't foresee how Delaware would weaponize its ruling. And that's how we got here. Today, a state home to just 0.3% of the U.S. population effectively sets U.S. corporate law a power it used to propel the country to number one on the Financial Secrecy Index, above Switzerland, Luxembourg, and the British Virgin Islands. Thanks to Delaware, the United States of America may be the best place to launder money. Victor Bout, one of the world's most notorious arms traffickers and inspiration for the 2005 film Lord of War, set up dozens of shell companies in Delaware. The state became a sanctuary for the profits he made selling weapons used in wars throughout Afghanistan, Iran, and Syria. Years long and absolutely brutal conflicts which remain poorly understood today. And Modern Conflicts, a nearly 30-episode Nebula original series by Real Life Lore, traces each of these wars from their very inception to the present day, telling stories that could only be told on an independent platform like Nebula free from the threat of demonetization. Thanks to the creative freedom offered by Nebula, Neo was able to make this investigation into Flight MH17, tech alter this critical look at how 9-11 changed cinema, and me this deeper look at how China works. By subscribing to Nebula, you not only get all these great original series, but you also get access to Nebula classes for no extra cost, where you can take a behind-the-scenes look at your favorite creators. There are no ads or sponsors, and many videos are available early. If you sign up today, you can get Nebula for 40% off with the annual plan. That's just $2.50 a month for both Nebula and Nebula classes with a link on screen or in the description.